first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for this amazing opportunity to be here and share a little bit of uh, what I'm doing in my postdoc here at Yale. So let me just, oops. And today I will be talking a little bit more about how metabolism regulates uh, cell fate and function in the mammalian skin. And around uh, 2000 years ago, um, Aristotle already uh, questioned himself and he thought that we are what we eat. Uh, he was absolutely right because every single molecule that um, pertains our body comes from our diet. What he couldn't phantom is the fact that um, these molecules, they actually get rearranged through a very complicated series of anabolic and catabolic uh, reactions, where you not only build macromolecules that are big, such as proteins and lipids, but you also can break them down through catabolic processes, generating not only uh, energy in, in the form of ATP, but also building blocks that are extremely important and also reducing power. What he also didn't uh, could fathom is the fact that all these reactions, they are interconnected and they are really um, not only uh, the reaction product of one reaction can be the reagent in another, and this is tightly regulated and more. If we think about everything that happens in a mammalian cell can be tracked down to the metabolism itself. If we think about, for example, cell proliferation, differentiation, and transformation, we can imagine that actually that's, uh, all these processes, they will involve a lot of protein biosynthesis because these cells, they need to build completely again a whole cell. Not only this, but lipid biosynthesis itself. Other examples such as uh, the creation of, and remodeling of the cytoskeleton inside of the cell or even secretion or signaling. This, is all, this can all be boiled down to protein synthesis and regulation degradation. And even processes such as transcription are ultimately regulated by the pools of acyl and methyl groups for acetylation and methylation. So if you think about it, everything inside of a mammalian cell is tightly linked to the metabolism and to the pool of building blocks that are presented in the cell in a given moment. That's why I, during my career, I'm trying to understand um, how metabolism regulates cell fate and function. If, is this process impacted by aging? And if it is, how? And maybe more interestingly, is it, impos it, is it possible to rewire this process for a better aging and diminished uh, age-related diseases? More specifically, during my postdoc here at Yale, I've been tackling these bigger picture uh, uh, questions, uh, working with wound bats in the skin. And I'm asking myself, how does metabolism regulate cell fate and function in wounds in the mammalian skin? And is this process impact impacted by aging? I have three main projects uh, because of time constraints, I won't be able to show all of them, but um, we have a paper submitted showing that secretomic changes at the single cell level in the wound bed can actually create a metabolic milieu for the wound bed. What I will be talking about today is about my project also with the metabolic crosstalk between adipocytes and immune cells that is impaired during aging. And more in the end of the talk, I will talk a little bit about my third project that I will be taking with me to my individual uh, lab uh, when I become a PI. Uh, and in this one, I created a, a platform of spatial transcriptomics integrated with metabolomics to inquire what are the changes that occur with aging and if caloric restriction are able to actually rescue that. But what exactly happens during the wound healing process in the mammalian skin? As soon as we have the skin being perforated and we use a mouse model of full thickness formulinar bunches in the back skin, we have a plethora of molecules, mainly inflammatory cytokines being secreted in the wound bed. And that ultimately lead to a recruitment of bone marrow derived monocytes that invade the skin and these cells in a very harsh environment, because with the wound, you completely ablate all the capillary system. And in the skin, uh, the capillaries, they exist only in the dermal compartment. The epidermis, that is this outer layer, does not present any capillaries. And the 
vasculature is the main uh, important access for nutrients for this tissue. So in this practically metabolic desert, these cells have to be very resilient because not only they need to migrate uh, into the wound bed, but they also need to uh, differentiate into fully differentiated macrophages. And they need to do so without proper uh, nutrient sources. And, but if this process happens um, correctly, we will have a healed wound with a scar or not. During aging, actually this doesn't happen. We have the accumulation of what we call chronic wounds. So these wounds, instead of uh, progressing towards healing, they actually get stalled in the inflammatory phase. And with that, we have a huge problem for public health in elderly people. And just to give you guys a little introduction on the different layers of the skin, we can notice that the outer layer skin, the epidermal compartment uh, is subsequently followed by the dermal compartment. And some cells that haven't been uh, explored a lot uh, are the adipocytes in the skin. They exist here in the dermal white adipose tissue. And with aging, two main things happen uh, in this tissue. We have not only a thinning in the epidermis, but this dermal white compartment have, uh, presents not only diminished number of adipocytes, but also diminished capacity to undergo lipolysis, which is the mobilization of the lipids inside of these adipocytes. And I won't have time to show you guys, but we show, uh, we have shown that caloric restriction, which is a protocol that increases health span and lifespan, actually completely rewires all these phenotypic changes in the skin. But what exactly happens to these adipocytes in the wound bed? As soon as you have the wound, these adipocytes, they start to mobilize their, these fatty acids inside of this huge unilocular lipid droplet and they completely change their uh, characteristics, becoming myofibroblasts. So somehow these lipids are used for something that right now is not very well understood. But what we know, as we can see here in this micrography, is that these cells, they lose this identity as uh, adipocytes and they start to express markers of myofibroblasts such as collagen-3 and uh, small, small, small muscle actin. Not only this, but when we use a model in which we completely ablate the adipocytes in the skin and we induce the wound using this model of uh, IDTR, a, a diphtyrotoxin receptor under the control of the adiponectin promoter, we can see here depicted that in the wound bed, uh, we, have a prox we are using CD31 as a proxy for revascularization or endothelial cells. We can see that with adipocytes, after five days in the wound bed, the skin is going great, the process of regeneration is occurring, but in the absence of adipocytes, we can see that the migration of these uh, endothelial cells and the wound um, resolution itself is completely ablated. Not only this, but very curiously, in the absence of adipocytes, we have a complete imbalance in the immune cells, the cells that are reaching uh, out the wound bed coming from the bone marrow. So we have an accumulation of the monocytes, the undifferentiated cells, and we have a lack of fully differentiated macrophages. So because of that, we asked ourselves, maybe these fatty acids derived from these skin adipocytes are fueling this monocyte to macrophage differentiation during this process of wound healing. And maybe this process is derailed during aging because we have like fewer adipocytes. In order to uh, ask if that was what going on, my first step was to actually uh, check are lipids being transferred between cells? And to our utter surprise, after six months, <laughs> uh, trying to show that these lipids, they were being released through the canonical methods of scavenging between uh, adipocytes, we actually realized that they were being uh, delivered in the wound bed in the form of extracellular vesicles containing small lipid droplets. And to our surprise, you guys can see that the skin actually produces uh, these extracellular vesicles even without the wound bed. But during the wound, wounding process, after 24 hours, we have a great increase. More than 80% of these um, extracellular vesicles are carrying lipids, which is the big difference between unwounded and wounded skin. Not only this, but when we use this elegant model of uh, lineage tracing, for the plasma membrane, in which we have the expression of EGFP under the control of the adiponectin uh, creep. 
uh, and the cells, the adipocytes only will have the plasma membrane expressing uh, green fluorescent protein. And just to remind you, the extracellular vesicles that are produced by mammalian cells, they are encapsulated by a thin layer of plasma membrane. So with this system, we can actually track down all the extracellular vesicles in the wound bed that are being generated from the adipocytes. We were able to show that, again, around 80% of the extracellular vesicles in the wound bed were coming from these adipocytes. The other 20%, uh, we actually managed to find what's, the, what's their origin, but I won't have time to show, but it's also very interesting. Not only this, but we wanted to track down and say, okay, these extracellular vesicles contain the same uh, types of lipids that are inside of these adipocytes because they are coming from these cells. So in order to do that, what we did was an untargeted lipidomics, and we saw that the extracellular vesicle profile was pretty similar to what we could find in the skin adipocytes. And very curiously, that profile of lipid uh, seemed to be regulated as the wound bed progresses and is completely impaired during aging. And not only this, but once we established that these adipocytes were producing these extracellular vesicles, we wanted to try to understand uh, if the monocytes were uptaking these extracellular vesicles and what they were doing with the content, with this lipid content. So in order to do so, what we did is that we did an untargeted and targeted metabolomics during the monocyte to macrophage differentiation to see which type of metabolic substrates were being used by these cells. And we could find out that not only mitochondrial intermediates were highly abundant, abundant and uh, more represented during the, this differentiation, but very curiously, we have a very good representation of lipid building blocks, showing that these lipids are being used for the differentiation itself. Not only this, but when we use uh, mitochondrial respiration, in this case, using oxygen consumption rates through the technology of seahorse, we can see here that in green, an indifferentiated monocyte has very low levels of uh, oxidative phosphorylation or oxygen consumption in this case. And when we stimulate for 24 hours with a signal for differentiation, or when we use lipids as a substrate, these cells, they increase their capacity to use the mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation. And when we use a tamoxifen, which is an inhibitor of the lipid import of CPT1 into the mitochondria, we ablate this. I won't have time to show you, but with the same uh, setup, we completely uh, abrogate the differentiation itself when we block lipid utilization. Not only this, but we wanted to use um, uh, transgenic models to actually uh, address this process. And again, I won't have time to show you, but we were able to show that in the absence of adipocytes, the process of monocyte to uh, macrophage differentiation doesn't happen, as I have shown you before. But maybe more interestingly, when these adipocytes don't have a TGL, which is the uh, rate limiting enzyme for lipolysis, the process of monocyte to macrophage differentiation still doesn't happen. And even more interestingly, when the monocytes lack the capacity to internalize the lipids into their mitochondria to use them for their metabolism, the cells also don't differentiate, showing that this is actually a very tightly regulated process of transfer of lipids that are being used in the mitochondria of these monocytes. But what exactly happens during aging? I was able to show that uh, in the old skin, not only in the wound bed, but in the whole skin as well, we have a lack of the production of lipid laden uh, extracellular vesicles. And more importantly, when we retrieve these extracellular vesicles and we expose them to young monocytes, uh, we see that these vesicles, they lack the capacity to completely rewire the mitochondrial uh, oxidative phosphorylation uh, and associated metabolism. And with that, uh, we believe that the, during the process of aging, we lack this capacity uh, to induce the differentiation of monocytes into macrophages. In order to be sure that that happens in vivo as well, what we did is that I isolated extracellular vesicles from young wound beds and old wound beds, and I used old mice. And I tried to ask, can these young extracellular vesicles containing lipids be able to rescue the wound in phenotype? Uh, 
So in order to do so, what I did is that I did a tissue cleaning and I disco to actually image the whole depth of the wound bed. So what you guys are going to be seeing in a bit is a bird's eye view of the wound bed. So it's like an upper side view. And I hope you guys can appreciate that here is an old wound bed. So we can see here in this pointed line, the, the place where the punch actually enters the skin. And here in magenta, uh, we can see the CD68 differentiated macrophages. And you guys can appreciate that here, I'm actually being generous because I'm grabbing an area that actually has a lot of macrophages because if you see areas like this, are completely lacking uh, macrophages at all. But when we inject young extracellular vesicles in the old mice, I hope you appreciate that we can completely uh, rewire the metabolism and induce the differentiation of these monocytes into macrophages. And the, then the old wound bed exposed to young extracellular vesicles have a, a very good representation of macrophages. So with that, I hope I have showed you guys that in the wound bed, the adipocytes have a key role of producing extracellular vesicles that are uptaken by monocytes and used by these cells to differentiate into macrophages. And this process is uh, impaired during aging. Uh, but what exactly is next for me? I'm in the job market. So what I'm going to try to answer uh, in my next step as an independent researcher is how metabolism regulate uh, not only this process of um, aging with the diminishment in self renew and senescence, not only immune cells, but also in stem cells. But I've been working for a while uh, with this uh, type of protocol called caloric restriction. This protocol was described by McKay in 1935, and with that, you were able to on, not only increase lifespan, but ameliorate a lot the health span of skin and other organs. And then you should and, kind of up, the time is up, so if you could, I mean, yes, go through it. My, my last slide. Uh, so what I did is that I developed this uh, very cool platform in which I'm integrating data from spatial single cell transcriptomics with spatial metabolomics. And with that, I can actually generate a maps of the whole skin of different populations, what they metabolize. And I hope that in my lab, I will be able to actually ask questions about how the metabolism impact development, homeostasis, but also aging disease and caloric restriction. And with that, I hope that I will be unveiling very basic aspects on how metabolism control mammalian cell fate. And with that, I would like to uh, thank our uh, collaborators, our funding agencies, and everyone in the lab. And I'm open to questions. Thank you so much. Thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, feel free to put your questions in the Q&A box. In the meantime, if I may ask one, one question myself. Sure. At the beginning of your talk, you told us about this really striking transition from, from, uh, from adipose cell to a myofibroblast. And yet, you showed us that what matters about this transition is the lipid droplets you know, and then how they sort of released into exophysicals. But does it matter that it becomes a myofibroblast? What do these myofibroblasts do in this context? That's a great question. And um, it's actually a very controversial question as well, because uh, right now in the literature, there's two views. Uh, so our lab uh, published that these cells, once they become myofibroblasts, uh, they don't actually come back. So it's like a terminal fate. But uh, there has been at least two other um, manuscripts showing that actually if you give enough time, these cells, they actually can rewire and start in, like, to accumulate lipids again. So what is the key mechanism uh, if the cells actually completely you know, like become senescent and they become like my uh, senescent myofibroblasts or if they are capable of being more plastic and actually coming back to being adipocytes is still under debate. I think it's super interesting. Um, I actually don't have uh, an opinion myself. <laughs> I think it needs better models to approach that. Okay, sounds great. Thank you. There doesn't seem to be any other questions. And oh, there's one now just came in. Martin Esterman asks, it's known that fatty acid oxidation is important for anti-inflammatory macrophage differentiation. Do you see an increase in pro-inflammatory macrophages in your aged mice? 
That's a, an amazing, amazing question. So I probed for all the different and like main substrates and like, uh, so main pathways, right? Glycolysis, um, glutaminolysis, because we didn't want to kind of go to deep in the rabbit hole of, um, I mean, different amino acids, but I probed for glutaminolysis as well. And also for, for beta oxidation. And when we manipulate the substrate available, we are able to actually prong the, the polarization, right? Because here I'm focusing more on the differentiation itself. So generating like um, non-polarized macrophages, right? But when you manipulate the substrate, we have a big difference between, you know, like the subtypes, uh, you know, like a pro-inflammatory and an anti-inflammatory. And it's very funny because the part that I didn't show that we kind of found like new secreted molecules, actually those molecules, they actually shift the usage of metabolic substrates, skewing the differentiation, it's the polarization itself towards more pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory. That's a very good question. Okay, great, thank you. We should probably move on, but there's another question in the Q&A box, perhaps you can answer it directly. Sure. 